I invite you to turn in your Bible this evening to Exodus chapter 26. This morning when we look at our outline that the first five verses of Psalm 33 are all about praise. Praise to the Lord God. And one of the one of the statements, there's a whole bunch of them, uh, play skillfully, <laughs> play on the harp. But one of the phrases was to sing God a new song, a new song. Tim Fisher, in his book, Battle for Christian Music, has pointed out that expression that appears a number of times in the Psalms, sing unto the Lord a new song, is that the song is new in character. The song is new in character. And one of the things that Tim Fisher points out is that the song that the saints sing as we sing to God is different in character than the world's song. It's different. It's different, of course, because of its subject. As we're going to look and be reminded again tonight, we're going to look at God's provision of salvation through Jesus Christ, his son. We sing about redemption. We sing about reconciliation. We sing about justification as we were just singing. All these blessed truths. It's a, it's a whole different subject. And we're singing about the love of God, which is a sacrificial love. Not a selfish love, a sacrificial love. But it's new, it's different in its character, in the style of the music as well. Because it, it, it just shows forth a reverence and a holiness because of the one to whom we bring it. So it's not about our feelings, it's all about our God. Sing unto him a new song. I just was reminded of that as we were singing those hymns tonight, and I was just blessed by that. We're in Exodus chapter 26. I want you to notice verse 31. Tonight we're going to be in Hebrews in just a moment, so get ready to move. But what, what the Lord brought to my heart for a scriptural thought uh, as we prepare for the Lord's table tonight has a connect, finds its beginning right here. And what we looked at on Wednesday night, we're studying the tabernacle. And in Exodus 26, beginning in verse 31, God told to Moses on the mountain, you shall make a veil woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. It shall be woven with an artistic design of cherubim. You shall hang it upon the four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be gold upon four sockets of silver. And you shall hang the veil from clasps. Then you shall bring the ark of the testimony in there. Behind the veil, the veil shall be a divider for you between the holy place and and the most holy. So Moses was instructed to uh, have the people of Israel uh, make a veil. And this veil was to be a divider. That's what we see here in verse 33. Uh, now, keep that in mind. The veil was a divider. And that veil was to separate the tabernacle into two rooms. The holy place and the most holy place. You see in verse 34, I didn't read it. But after the ark was put behind the veil in the most holy place, then the mercy seat was placed on top. And it was there at the mercy seat that God manifested his presence and his glory. It was also there at the mercy seat that the high priest would go in once a year on the Day of Atonement to sprinkle the blood before the mercy seat in the presence of God to make, uh, uh, to make an atonement for the nation of Israel every year, every year. And that veil was a divider. Why? Well, because the priests would be in the holy place, wherein was the table of showbread, the golden altar. We haven't learned that yet on Wednesday nights. We're coming up to it. The golden altar was right up against the veil and was considered a part of the most holy place, except that it was outside that veil because the priests had to bring incense on it. And in order for that, it had to be on this side of the veil, but it stood directly before and in front of the Ark of the Covenant, which had the mercy seat upon it. The incense symbolized the prayers that the priests would bring directly to God. But what was right in front of them? A veil, a beautiful veil, an artistic veil, 
but a veil nonetheless, a divider. What is it that divides from the presence of God? Well, it's our sins. Our sin has separated us from God. Because we are sinners, we cannot go into the presence of God. We cannot stand before a holy and a righteous God as we are as sinners. By the way, on the other side then, of course, was the golden lampstand as well. All of that in the holy place, and this veil was a divider. Now, with that, let's turn to the book of Hebrews. First of all, chapter 9. The writer of Hebrews is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. And actually, we'll take a moment, look back in chapter 8 first, just to refresh you of the context. And the writer of Hebrews is pointing to Jesus Christ, a high priest of a whole different order, after the order of Melchizedek, a high priest of a whole different covenant, the new covenant, a high priest with a whole different sacrifice, not the blood of goats and rams and oxen, but by the blood of the Son of God. We'll see that here in a moment. Chapter 8, verse 1. We've seen this recently a number of times, but just to set the context, verse 1 of Hebrews 8. Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also having something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, for he said, that is God said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he, that is Jesus Christ, our great high priest, he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also a mediator of a better covenant was a, which was established on better promises. A tremendous difference and a change. Now look at chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 6 is where I want to begin. Speaking about the Old Testament temple, tabernacle, and the picture as we just saw of heaven itself, the whole priesthood, the Lord Jesus Christ would come as a great high priest of the Melchizedekian order to enter into the presence of God on our behalf with his own blood, we'll see. But speaking of the tabernacle in the Old Testament and all that went along with it, the offerings and the uh, uh, articles uh, that were in the tabernacle, all of those things, now verse 6, when these things had been thus prepared, all the implements of the tabernacle, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle. That's the holy place performing the services, but into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance, the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances uh, imposed until the time of reformation. But Christ came as a high priest of good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, 
but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, the great high priest, entered within that veil into the presence of God in heaven. And the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross shed his blood to pay for our sins, offering himself as a better sacrifice, not a sacrifice that would be done and repeated year after year, time after time, but once for all, removed sin, the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, picking it up in verse 13, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. And uh, that just begins to get a glimpse. We won't talk about it tonight. But the far greater promises that God ever made under the law at Sinai, there are far greater promises to those who come to God through Jesus Christ and are cleansed through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, look down, please, at verse 23. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens, talking about heaven, should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with, with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself now, to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once, at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation." Notice now that the Lord Jesus Christ, when he entered into heaven, uh, again, we're reminded in verse 24, the earthly tabernacle, the earthly temple, these were copies of the true, that which is in heaven, where God the Father is. Jesus Christ didn't enter into the tabernacle to make an offering. No, no, Jesus Christ entered into heaven itself. And when the Lord Jesus Christ entered into heaven itself, as you know, when Jesus was on the cross and he cried, it is finished, after he gave up the spirit, the veil was rent from the top to the bottom. Why? There's no more divider. There is no more divider. You see, the tabernacle was designed to be one. One. In heaven, there is no divider. In heaven, now, if we come through Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, we go into the very presence of God. If there's no veil in heaven, where's the veil? <laughs> it's us, our flesh. <laughs> Remember, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we will drop this robe of flesh and we will have a new body one day. That's why the resurrection is so important. We will have a new glorified body. Why? We're going into the presence of God. And don't be afraid. Your Savior is right there at the right hand of God. First John tells us he is our advocate. He is the one who makes intercession for us. It will be a welcoming. It will be a welcoming. Jesus Christ entered. Once, verse 28, once he died on the cross to bear the sins of many, and he's coming again to those who eagerly wait for him. 
he is coming again. Now, just a couple more verses in chapter 10. Verse 1, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, it pointed to wonderful things in Jesus Christ and these promises. And that, that law, not the very image of the things, can never, with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Well, they would have, but they didn't. For the worshipers once purified would have no more conscience of sin, but in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. When we come to this table, we have a reminder of a sacrifice that Jesus made that removes our sin. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. When we come to this table, instead of having a reminder of our sins, we have a reminder of a cleansing that took place to remove our sins. It's precious. Verse 4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. Therefore, when he came into the world, the incarnation, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, that is in the Old Testament sacrifices, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously, saying sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of of Jesus Christ once for all, once for all. And so we gather to remember, Christ died for us, opened the way, removed the divider, and we will follow him there into the presence of God. We remember that Christ died for our sins. Let's turn in our Rejoice hymnal to number 163.